So in three, two. Good afternoon. I now call to order the meeting of the Equity Committee for Thursday, March 17th, 2022. In accordance with board policy 8311, the chair of a committee at their discretion and after consultation with the staff liaison may convene an in-person committee meeting. Otherwise, all committee meetings will be held electronically. Today's meeting is being held virtually and broadcast through Microsoft Teams. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, all voting items this afternoon will be done by a roll call vote. Board members will say their names before making and seconding a motion as applicable, as well as when requesting discussion on an agenda item. Ms. Fast, please call the role of board members to determine the presence of a quorum of the committee. Ms. Scott. Present. Dr. Hager. Present. Ms. Jose. Present. Ms. Rowe. And Mr. Thomas. Here. Thank you. And Ms. Fass, please call and note the names of um, any staff members on the committee participating in today's meeting. Dr. Yarborough. Mr. Handy. Present. Hey, Ms. Fass, please call and note the names of any additional staff members participating in today's meeting. Dr. Boswell McComas. Present. Dr. Holmes. Present. Dr. Elmendorf. Present. Ms. Forbes. Present. Thank you. Thank you for that, Ian. Are there any other members who are participating on the call that um, that I've not named or that we've not named? Any board members? No. OK, great. Thank you then. OK, so it looks like our um, first uh, matter of business is the virtual learning program. The presentation will be by Dr. Douglas Elmendorf and Ms. Julie Forbes. Oh, yes, um, Mr. Handy. Yes, thank you, Ms. Scott. Um, just to have one. Uh, announcement before we hear from uh, Dr. Emmendorf and Ms. Forbes. The presentation that they are about to deliver, uh, the slide deck for their presentation was updated in board docs this morning. So just wanted to make sure if anyone who retrieved that presentation before this morning, um, this is the current version that you're about to see them present. And it is, um, as of this morning, current on board docs. I just wanted to share that, so thank you. Great, thank you. Okay. So then we can go ahead with a virtual learning um, presentation. Yeah, we for that. I guess we call on Dr. Douglas Elmendorf and Ms. Thank Julie Forbes. Thank you, and and thanks, um, Mr. Handy, for mentioning that. I will just let you know that if you still have the quote old version of today's PowerPoint in your possession, that's okay. The um, changes that we made were um, almost exclusively aesthetic ones, just to make it a little bit more um, engaging visually. So the content is, has not changed since the last version. Um, good, so good afternoon and thank you for having us back. We were here in January. Um, Ms. Forbes and I will be sharing results from the VLP Parent Guardian Survey as well as the VLP Student Survey. As you may remember from the Equity Committee meeting in January, we conducted a fall survey of VLP families. Based on the feedback from members of this committee, we added a student survey and extended both surveys to collect information related to reasons for choosing VLP disaggregated by student group, which was the request. We will share those results with you today. Next slide, please. Because we added a survey and extended the surveys, there are quite a bit of data to report. We know that some of these slides are busier than is usually ideal for a presentation, but we wanted to include as much information as possible for you to explore before, during, and after this meeting. We will certainly do our best to summarize the information on each slide and answer any related questions. Ms. Forbes will now share with you some overall enrollment data to remind us of our conversation in January. Ms. Forbes, Great. next slide, please. Okay. So we shared this slide and the upcoming slide during our first presentation, and they are included again as a reference point. The slide represents the overall VLP enrollment and BCPS enrollment. The VLP data represents approximately 3,000 students from throughout BCPS who are enrolled in the virtual learning program. 
as of January of 2022. And the BCPS enrollment data referenced in this slide was sourced from the Maryland report card and is reflective through September of 2021. There are some similarities and differences when comparing BLP enrollment to overall BCPS enrollment. For example, the percentage of Black and African American students who are enrolled in BLP is nearly 58%, while enrollment in BCPS is approximately 39%. The enrollment of Hispanic and Latino students in BLP is just over 8%, compared to 12% of the BCPS enrollment. The percentage of white students in VLP is slightly above 20%, compared to 36% of enrollment in BCPS. The VLP was created as a direct response to the pandemic. We know that some student groups were disproportionately impacted by the pandemic. This may be reflected in these enrollment data. Next slide, please. The percentage of students who are English learners is just above 4% in the VLP, lower than the district enrollment of 8%. In addition, the percentage of students who qualify for special education services is nearly 11%, slightly lower than the district, district enrollment of approximately 13%. Next slide, please. Thank you, Ms. Forbes. This is just to give you an idea of um, how many people responded to our survey. So as you can see, 475 parents or guardians responded to the survey and 1,125 students responded to the survey. Next slide, please. I added this slide in here just to um, give you an idea of what the rest of the, the presentation will look like as far as structure goes. So the first half of this presentation, if you will, um, is dedicated to talking exclusively about the results of VLP parents and guardians and their responses. The second half of this um, presentation will be dedicated exclusively to the student responses. Next slide, please. So this slide represents some general demographic information of the parents and guardians who responded to the survey, again, not the students. The percentage, percentages generally mirror that of the actual enrollment in VLP. Next slide, please. In the fall survey, we gave parents the opportunity to select multiple reasons for deciding to enroll their child in VLP, if you'll remember. Based on the feedback from this committee, in the spring survey, we asked parents to choose their top reason for enrolling in the VLP. As you can see, the most popular reason at 26% was because there was someone besides the student in the household that had a medical condition that made them more vulnerable, vulnerable to COVID-19. When we combine this number with the 19% that enrolled in VLP due to the student's personal medical concern, we see that 45% enrolled due to a medical concern of some nature. However, almost a quarter of the respondents indicated that they chose VLP because their child or children work better online and were able to maintain grades equal to or better than what they earned in their brick and mortar schools. This will be an important data point to consider when discussing what VLP might look like in future years. When we dig into the comments associated with the families that chose other, as you can see there in the, I guess that's like a fuchsia um, colored bar, um, their reason for enrolling in VLP, we see that the vast majority are actually COVID related, even though they chose other. Um, based on the comments, it seems that families chose other so that they had an opportunity to actually explain how COVID impacted their decision to um, enroll in VLP. Finally, the reason that was least popular for choosing VLP was bullying or another negative experience at the brick and mortar school. Next slide, please. This slide shows a breakdown by student group response. This is, in fact, one of the busy slides to which I referred earlier and could be used for further reflection beyond this presentation. No fear, however, because the upcoming slides will break down the responses of each of the student subgroups. Next slide, please. This chart shows a breakdown of responses for parents and guardians who indicated Asian for race and ethnicity. This pie chart represents the responses of 45 individuals. The highest response rate was in the category of my child has a medical condition that makes them more susceptible to COVID-19, which was followed closely at 22% by someone else in the household has a medical condition. It is noted that 22% of respondents also identified my child or children work better online. The area with the lowest response rate was the option related to bullying. Next slide, please. This chart shows the rate of responses for parents who, who indicated Black or African American for race and ethnicity. This pie chart represents the responses of 242 individuals. 
The highest response rate was in the category of someone else in the household has a medical condition, followed by the student has a medical condition. Again, the area with the lowest response rate was the option related to bullying. Next slide, please. This chart shows the rate of responses for parents who indicated Hispanic or Latino for race and ethnicity. This pie chart represents the responses of 21 individuals. The combined percentage for the two COVID related responses was 52.4%. Almost a quarter of the families chose VLP because they feel their child works better online and maintains the same grades or better than in person. Next slide, please. This chart shows the rate of responses for parents who indicated, indicated two or more races. This pie chart represents the responses of 62 individuals. The COVID related responses equal nearly 50% of the respondents. Again, almost a quarter of the respondents indicated that child works better online. The response with the lowest rate was again, bullying related reasons. Next slide, please. This chart shows the rate of responses for parents who indicated white for race and ethnicity. This pie chart represents the responses of 117 individuals. The highest response rate was in the category of I work better online, my grades uh, or my child works better online, excuse me, my gr the grades have stayed the same or have improved. Following this were the two COVID related responses with a combined percentage of 32%. The area with the lowest response rate was for the option related to scheduling flexibility for families. Next slide, please. The response to the question of whether a family would want to continue in the VLP beyond the pandemic was actually almost identical to the response in the fall survey with 90% of the families saying yes or maybe to continuing. Um, incidentally, we have been um, surveying our current VLP, not surveying, but um, asking our current VLP families if they actually do intend make a decision on whether you intend to return next year. And this 90% is very close to the number we're seeing in that data, those data as well. Next slide, please. While it is vitally important to consider data related to attendance and course performance, as we will hear in the upcoming Board of Education meeting on Tuesday, it is also important to measure parents' perceptions of the program. As you can see in this pie chart, despite an inordinate number of teacher vacancies, a high percentage of long-term substitutes, and other challenges associated with a brand new learning environment, over three quarters of the families surveyed reported having a very positive or positive experience in the VLP. A mere 3% or 16 respondents indicated having a negative or very negative experience. These data represent the amazing work that Ms. Forbes and her team have done throughout the year. At this time, I will turn the presentation over to Ms. Forbes, who will share the student survey data. Next slide, please. <laughs> Great, thank you. Next slide, please. 1,125 students enrolled in the VLP in grades three through 12 responded to the student survey. There are approximately 2,369 students enrolled in these grade levels, so this represents 47% of the students who are eligible to respond. The highest response rate was at the middle school level for grades six, seven, and eight. And all of the data I'm uh, about to review is based on, again, the student responses to the student survey that was administered last month. Next slide, please. This chart represents the race and ethnicity that students indicated on their survey response. Nearly 50% of student respondents indicated Black or African American, approximately 22% indicated white, nearly 14% indicated two or more races, just above 7% indicated Asian, and 5.5% indicated Hispanic or Latino. Next slide, please. This slide shows the reasons students indicated for the following question. Why did you or your parent guardian decide to enroll you in the VLP for the 2021-22 school year? Please select your top answer. Please note, students could only choose one response for this question. If they chose other, they had the opportunity to share more information through an open-ended response. The option with the highest response rate was other at just above 29%. A review of the other responses noted that the majority of students indicated COVID-19 and elaborated further on their unique sit, uh, situation um, for themselves. Other responses to this question included reasons such as parent or guardian required enrollment in the VLP. Some students stated they moved and it was more convenient to stay in the VLP. Many stated, I don't know. 
and some students reiterated that they work better online and that they prefer it. Next slide, please. OK, this slide shows a breakdown by student group response similar to what Dr. Elmendorf shared earlier. It's a very busy slide and the upcoming slides will break down the responses of each student group. Again, it's noted throughout that the majority of student responses fell into the other category. Next slide, please. This slide, uh, rather this chart shows a breakdown of responses for students who indicated Asian for race and ethnicity and represent the responses of 87 students. The highest response rate was in the category of other and the majority of these responses included more detail about COVID-19 related concerns. The area with the lowest response rate was for the option related to bullying. Another area of note is that 16% of students responded that they work better online and their grades have stayed the same or improved when compared to, with their face-to-face -face grades. Okay, next slide, please. This chart shows the rate of responses for students who indicated Black or African American for race and ethnicity and represents the responses of 567 students. The highest response rate was in the category of other. And again, most of the responses were related um, to COVID-19 and students shared more detail um, about their individual um, circumstances. Other responses under other stated the following reasons for enrollment in DLP. Again, parent guardian choice. Um, it was a choice the parent or guardian made. Some students indicated they moved um, and others discussed a preference for working online and just elaborated on this topic and why they preferred this setting. The area with the lowest response rate was for the option related to bullying. And another area of note is that 15% of students responded that they work better online and their grades have stayed the same or improved when compared with their face-to-face -face grades. Next slide, please. This chart shows the rate of responses for students who indicated Hispanic or Latino for race and ethnicity. The pie chart represents the responses of 63 students. The highest response rate was shared in two categories um, in the areas of I feel more comfortable working online due to anxiety or social emotional concerns and online learning helps my family and me with flexible scheduling. The area with the lowest response rate was for the option related to bullying with no students choosing this response. Next slide, please. Okay, this chart shows the rate of responses for students who indicated two or more races for race and ethnicity and represents the responses of 156 students. The highest response rate was again in the category of other, and most of these responses included more detail about COVID-19 related concerns. It's noted that nearly 20% of students stated, I feel more comfortable working online due to anxiety or social emotional concerns. The area with the lowest response rate was for the option, I work better online. Next slide, please. This chart shows the rate of responses for students who indicated white for race and ethnicity and represents the, res the responses of 247 students. The highest response rate was in the category of I work better online, my grades have stayed the same or improved. Following this, two options had similar response rates of around 20%. I feel more comfortable working online due to anxiety or social emotional concerns and other. Um, more than half of the students who responded other, again, shared more specific information about a COVID-19 related concern and the area with the lowest response rate was for the option related to bullying. Next slide, please. When asked, are you interested in continuing with a full-time virtual option after the public health concerns of the pandemic have decreased, 29% of students stated yes, nearly 26% stated no, and 43% stated maybe. Next slide, please. And this chart captures the responses regarding students' overall experience in VLP this year. Nearly 55% of students reported very positive or positive, 31% were neutral, and just over 9% reported a negative or very negative experience this year. There was not an additional question to learn why students may have reported negative or very negative, and the VLP coordinators and supervisors in collaboration with their staff will continue to address any student concerns on a daily basis and provide support. Next slide, please. And that concludes our presentation. We'd be happy to take any questions that you might have at this time. Great. Yes, thank you um, very much for that. Um, and I can just go around to all board members so that we can um, make sure that we get everybody's um, questions. Um, I can start first uh, with um, Mr. Thomas. 
Did you have any questions or comments? I, I do have a question. Um, I, I'm trying, I, sorry, I was trying to look back at the slide before I, I share. You, <laughs> you can go to someone else and like, you come back to me. Oh, OK, yeah, I'll just go around. Um, uh, Dr. Hager, did you have any questions or comments? Um, just two quick things, um, and I, I feel like I ask this all the time because I can never remember the answer, but is there funding secured for this program for next year already? Yes, same same funding source. Yes. Yeah. So so there's one more year that with firm funding, and then we're deciding what to do after that. Is that accurate? Um, it does. Next year is firmly funded. Dr. McComas, I'm not sure how to answer the question about the year following. Thank you. It just gave me a second. So um, as you know, um, long story short, let me just cut to the chase. Long story short, what we will do is we will monitor and look at if, if there is a need to continue to request grant funds for the following year. As you know, the grant has a, a lifeline. Um, and so if we were to move to anything permanent, we would need to look at that um, funding plan to transition to an operating budget. But fortunately, we do have the, the grant to fund it uh, this year, next year, and then we have not put it into the grant for that following year. We would have to reassess the situation. Thank you so much. I, that was what yeah. I thought, but I, I wasn't quite sure. I appreciate that. Um, awesome. I, I just thinking of, of the, the it was just really nicely done, by the way. I really appreciate the work that you guys put into this. It was it was very well presented and, and, and a very well done survey. Um, and the fact that half of the families suggested a COVID related or more than that, if you incorporate the other category, um, COVID related concerns, just, you know, it'll be interesting to see how many do end up enrolling next year and what ends up happening. And then as far as from an equity lens, um, the majority of or a larger proportion of the white families felt that this was an academically advantageous approach for them. So just thinking that, um, you know, although it may be a, a, a good program overall, it may not be um, as as an equity or solution to our inequities within our our system, given that um, that particular data point. I know that there are many other data points we'll look at as well, but just that was something that that struck me from the presentation. Mm -hmm. So. That's all. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Ms. Jones. Thank you for the presentation. Um, Dr. McComas, do the parents and children have to enroll every year since we are funded for next year or are they automatically enrolled? So uh, that's something the team and I have been discussing. Um, and so I'll turn it over to Dr. Ellendorf to talk sure, about yep. sort of the, where we are with that, because as you know, this is really, we're just starting our second year. Um, and so that's part of our finding our way forward. Right, thank you, Ms. Joe. That's a great question. So um, we um, submitted, I think, an executive summary on Friday that indicates that we are continuing with a co-enrolled program for next year that will, um, offer the program to students who are currently enrolled in the VLP. So at this time, we're not planning on opening enrollment to any new students. And so what we've done is to determine what the projected enrollment will be, which will you know, lead us into certainly doing some staffing, um, is determine which of our current VLP students are planning on return, which families are planning on returning. And so uh, we've sent that email out, that form out, and parents have done a great job in responding. And from what we can tell, it's very similar to the, the data that you see here in this um, in this PowerPoint. About 90% of the families who are currently enrolled in VLP plan on returning next year. And, and the ones that don't want to return, they would come back to? They would go back to in-person learning. In-person, okay. Most likely, unless they choose something different. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I can go ahead as, um, and then I'll go to Mr. Thomas. Um, I wanted to know it, it just and also again that was very well done and very informative so I uh, greatly appreciate it um, from what I gather on the slides it looked like if you're um, that with the parent responses if you're a, a parent of a child or a person of color um, it looked like the higher responses were that they were not returning due to medical reasons as far as someone in the home or um, uh, someone has a uh, pre-existing condition that makes them susceptible to COVID. I can't remember the exact language, whereas um, it said that white the white students responded that they learned better online, just out of the respondents. And what I wanted to know is, based on the different responses that were received, 
do we have appropriate supports so that we can provide the students, the parents, the families with the very supports that they require? Um, so if it's a, a medical issue or, or something like that, or if it's anxiety, or um, if it's that the child learns better online, but being able to support each of those student groups differently and not do like sort of like a one size fits all. How are we, I guess my question is, how are we addressing that? That's a great question and I will start and I think Ms. Forbes might want to give some more um, on the ground information, some, some more details perhaps um, after I kind of give, share some information that I'm aware of and that is that um, remember, it's good for us to remember that this is a co-enrolled program so any resource that a student can access in his or her home school, they can access that as a member of the VLP. So for example, if a student has um, a medical concern that they need some advice on, they can go to their school nurse that's in their brick and mortar um, schoolhouse and talk to that school nurse just like they would and even visit that school nurse physically if they're willing to, um, just as they would um, if they were actually doing their learning in, in the schoolhouse. So th all of those resources that were um, accessible to them in the brick and mortar facility are continue to be accessible, albeit albeit not maybe as easily accessible if the family is not wanting to go anywhere in person. And I would uh, so and then I'll also say in the VLP currently we do have um, support resources um, including you know school counselors for example. Um, one, one thing I will say though for you know we always try to refine what we're doing and this is a brand new program and one thing that we uh, realized this year is that while we appreciate having some of those um, human resources um, to partner with in the brick and mortar school, wouldn't it be even better if they were actually part of the VLP? And so um, next year we plan to have some of those resources like a school social worker, for example, um, pupil personnel worker and some other um, human resource positions that are exclusive to the VLP so that those they can be um, responsive specifically to students who are in the virtual learning program. Did you want to give any any other specific details, Ms. Forbes, about how we support our students in the program? No, I, I think you covered it well and just again want to highlight the work of the school counselors in the VLP because oftentimes those are the individuals who connect students with a lot of those school based resources. Great, thank you all very much for that. Um, and I guess my um, last question um, would be as far as making sure um, that um, I think it was already asked and answered as far as making sure that it's funded and making sure that we give the children um, the appropriate resources. One thing that I think was good that you all showed um, where it asked about bullying, um, that was interesting. That was the lowest um, response that um, for them wanting to be online. It didn't seem to have anything to do with feeling bullied or anything at school. And um, I guess I just wanted to make sure, was that a correct interpretation that I have? That's because it seemed like that was the lowest on um, actually across all of them. Yes, we were really glad that you asked us to dig deeper into this because what we didn't know from the fall survey and what you didn't know um, from the fall survey is how important that response was um, because we let people choose as many res responses as they wanted to as to why they wanted to be in the VLP. And so this was really encouraging to us to see that um, you know, our brick and mortar schools are doing a great job with keeping our students safe to the point where they're not trying to escape their brick and mortar schools to go to a virtual environment. That that percentage, as you saw, was really, really low. And so um, that was really informative for us to um, be able to see that. And yes, you're, you're interpreting exactly correctly where students did not choose as their top choice, at least um, that they were they, they were choosing VLP because of bullying. And in many cases, even when they chose other, they didn't choose other so that they could elaborate on some big bullying incident that they were involved in. They typically, as Ms. Forbes and I said, chose to talk more about their COVID related situation when they mm -hmm. chose other rather than, than anything else. Mm -hmm. Great, yes, and thank you for including that. That was, that was um, very important. Um, Mr. Thomas, are you ready? Thank you, Ms. Scott, thank you. I, all I, right. I've, <laughs> I've got all my questions ready. So. Um, if we can go back to slide number 26, it's a, it's the student response um, related to the Hispanic or Latino students. That is slide. It might be. It's my slide 24. OK, yeah, can you go back to that slide? I'm not sure who's driving. 
if not, I can just look at it and, and speak to that. I just wanted to bring it up for reference for the board members. But anyway, so on this slide, um, what was interesting about the Hispanic or Latino students is that from out of all the groups, you know, they mm -hmm. this, this population of students indicated the least amount of COVID-19 related concerns. You know, the majority of the, of, of the survey results um, were, I feel more comfortable working online due to anxiety or social emotional concerns and online learning helps my family and me with flexible scheduling. Um, the next one is a tie between I work better online, my grades have stayed the same or improved, and also someone else in my family has a medical condition related to COVID-19. So I'm, I'm wondering, you know, what kind of, what is this showing about our school system in terms of the services that we're, we might be providing for Hispanic and Latino students? You know, if the majority of students are saying that they're virtual because it's more flexible for their family and they work, feel like they, that they work better online, then from an equity standpoint, I think that like that might be a target group that we might have to have to look at or to reference. And I wanted to hear what are some of, of the thoughts of the individuals from the virtual learning program as to why some more of our Hispanic or Latino students are answering this way in comparison to COVID-19 related concerns? Or are there any ideas as to why that might be? Off the top of my head, Mr. Thomas, I'm, I wouldn't want to speculate as to why necessarily Hispanic students are choosing um, that they feel more comfortable in an online learning environment than perhaps some of the other student groups. And really, they weren't able to elaborate necessarily on why they they chose that as the response. So I don't, I don't, I don't feel comfortable speculating on why that might be the case. Yeah, I'm not sure if you have some more some more on the ground insight, Ms. Forbes, but I'm not sure why they chose that. No, um, I, I also don't want to speculate, but I really appreciate the observation um, and that you noticed there were kind of some differences on that slide um, regarding our Hispanic and Latino students. Yeah, I, I just noticed that and I think, you know, maybe it may be a something that our public and motor schools aren't providing for our Hispanic population. So I was thinking it might be, well, you know, maybe there, there's a larger, a larger amount of our ESOL students or English learning, language learning students might be Hispanic or Latino. So maybe that could have an influence and in, in why they might have a virtual learning program. So I, I definitely think that, you know, maybe looking further into that, it isn't all COVID-19 related in that sense. And so I think from an equity standpoint, we really have to look at that data. And, and I, I want to meet with some of those students and, 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 and hear their perspectives. Um, also, on in comparing the parent survey results to the student survey results, yeah. you know, oh, Mr. Mr. Handy wants to comment. Um, oh, Ms. Scott, if that's okay. Mr. Handy, do you have a response to Mr. Thomas' question about Latino students? I do, I do. Thank you, Ms. Scott. So, Mr. Thomas, thank you for that that observation, that question. And I guess as I was processing that, right, that this snapshot from our leadership and VLP gave us some insight and you started heading at it. What I'd like to do, because it does speak to, like you said, what happens in brick and mortar. So just wanted to take the ticket on that. I, I will take the ticket um, in working with Dr. Elmendorf, um, Ms. Forbes, maybe to get some some focus groups or, you know, they turn this around pretty quickly, but want to hear from those students in the VLP. And as I understand your question, you know, if flexible options are needed for more students in our brick and mortar, we should explore that. Because as you mentioned, let's say the pandemic goes away in two years, um, these students are still looking potentially for that option um, that gives them that flexibility. So thank you for your observation. Just wanted to let you know that I'll, I'll be following up on that for my I would that. also just mention from a statistical standpoint, it is only 63 students we're talking about, and sometimes those percentages can get skewed um, when you have a, a lower number of students. I'm not the expert on that necessarily, but I do know that 63 students isn't a, a lot, and, the, and this percentages can get skewed relatively quickly perhaps. Right. Right. And, but but I'm thinking about that too, and I, know, I think we got a response rate. I think of like upper forty percent. Um, but I'm just wondering if it's an opportunity, and I don't know the overall enrollment of Hispanic Latino students in the VLP. But I yeah, certainly appreciate what you shared. I'm just curious if there is something we can tease out around um, service to students in that particular student group. Um, but yeah, good point on that too. Well, thank you, Mr. Handy, for saying that. And thank you, Mr. Elmendorf, for, for the sample size kind of explanation there. Because that was another thing. Maybe it could have been the sample size only being 63% that could have resulted in that. So I was just trying to dig deeper. Um, thank you, Mr. Handy. Uh, so comparing the parent survey results to the student results, you know, a quarter of students said no, that right. they do not want to continue with COVID, with, with virtual learning, that they are ready to be back in schools, while 10% of parents said no. So we know that 
you know, um, a, a substantial more pro proportion of students, you know, right. one out of every four students are saying that they don't want to continue virtual learning, while one out of 10 parents are saying they don't. So I'm wondering how will like the student voice to be able to say like, I don't want to continue virtual learning. How will, how do you think that might play a factor in, in the parent's decision as to whether or not to continue or not? That's a great question. And Mr. Thomas, I know that you never disagree with your parents, but in some cases, some kids do. <laughs> um, just kidding. So um, <laughs> yes, we, that was really interesting to us too. So, you know, what Ms. Forbes and I were kind of sitting when we were looking at these data saying, um, in some cases, our students really have, they know themselves really well, especially our, our older students or high school students, and they know they learn better in person, but the parents, because they're parents and that's their job is to be um, concerned about their child's health. Um, and, and in conversations, because we are having those conversations now about um, you know, saying to the parents, we think your child would do better in, in an in-person environment um, because they're, they're really struggling here in the VLP. And the parents like, well, thank you for your advice, but we're still in a pandemic and I really want my students to stay in the VLP despite the um, lack of progress they might be demonstrating. And the students say, well, mom, I wanna go back. So it's, we're, they, we're in that phase now where we've just come out of Omicron and while the health metrics are getting better, not everyone is feeling comfortable, um, especially now, you know, some of the conversation has been now that masks are off, um, I, I wanna wait a little bit to see how that all kind of rolls out and then may, then I'll want my child to go back. So it's, it's these case by case basis, ongoing conversations with families so that the parents and the staff can um, work together with the students, especially the older students, to determine what the best environment will be going forward. I can tell you that if the health metrics do improve, continue to improve, and we are um, at a situation where we really feel like the student, despite many, many efforts to improve their performance in the VLP, just doesn't seem to be an online learner. That's not their profile. Um, we want to get to the point where we are strongly encouraging, potentially even requiring a student to go back to in-person learning for their best interest, assuming there's not a medical condition that precludes them from being able to do that safely. Okay, thank you. And I'm glad to hear that there are some recommendations coming to, to households about students who maybe should be, who can transition back into online person. And, and that, that does kind of suffice. Well, where's the student voice going with there? So thank you for sharing that. Um, on the... On slide 27 for me, which is the results for our students with two or more races um, and, and their survey results, uh, just looking at the data, it's again yeah. in complete difference from a lot of the other uh, racial groups that were that were studied. Um, but this one is as a larger sample size with 100, 156 students, so it is a substantial number. Right. It's interesting because 12.8 percent of the students that are two or more races and that's about 20 students from the sample size said that they were bullied and had negative experiences in face-to-face -face school that impacts my success in the classroom which is interesting because i i am a student a multiracial student and so I, I took a special look into this data and i was thinking about my experiences with bullying in the past and how being mm -hmm. multiracial has definitely played a factor into that so i'm wondering this makes me think from an active perspective that like again we're saying that, that not, not a lot of students are saying that they've been affected by bullying, but here we have a, a number of students, one in 10 students from our, our two or more races that are, that are saying just that. Um, so I think it's something else that we have to look into. And I think in conversation with those students, we could we could maybe learn about those perspectives and maybe figure out ways that in the brick and mortar schools, we're trying to cut back on bullying for multiracial students. And we're trying to make sure that multiracial students are feeling welcomed in their school community. Because, you know, I definitely had um, a few negative interactions from many different racial groups in, in, in my time. I never really felt like I could I belonged in, in a school community because I wasn't one race per se. So. I don't think it's something else that we should look into. Um, and then another question I had was rela relating to the students who are would be leaving virtual learning program right now. Um, are we are going forward? I know currently for those students that are still requesting to go virtual when there's an opening, you know, those students can go into the virtual learning program. Um, is that still occurring? Can students still come in if they're if they're no, um, no so as of september 30th we closed enrollment co-enrollment really we closed co-enrollment to we closed co-enrollment um there were some some very very um minor some some very, some very small number excuse me of exceptions due to a new medical condition that a, a family might have been experiencing after september 30th but um the co-enrollment opportunity closed on september 30th 
and um, there's not an intent to to open that co enrollment process at this point. So there's not a, an intent to to allow in new students to the VLP going forward. At this time, at least. OK, even for next year, there's not Correct. any intent. Right. Right, so the, the plan for next year is to allow students who are currently in the VLP to re-enroll if they would like and are being successful in VLP, but there's at this time there's not a, um, a plan to open enrollment to new students. Even to fill the seats that are, are being vacated because students are coming back into the school building? Right. Okay. Right, because we're still trying to continue the um, the original purpose of of standing up this program in the first place, which was to respond to the pandemic. And so certainly if if we find out there's a family who has a situation that is um, extenuating circumstances that that we don't think home and hospital is the, the best solution, we would certainly consider the VLP for that person. But in general terms, the VLP wouldn't isn't um, set up to be open for new enrollments. OK, thank you. Thank you. Um, and I just have one last question. Do we have an idea of where the majority of these um, responses came from? I know it's a sampling. Is it like all over the district from all schools or is it one area more than another um, area? I don't think we asked. Did we miss Forbes? I don't think we asked which school or zone the student was from in the survey. OK, thank you. OK, any additional questions? Um, this is Erin Hager. Sorry, I don't have a uh, chat oh, yeah. um, ahead, access, but the uh, um, so I think you just answered my question though. It's not it was not an identifiable survey, correct? It was anonymous. Correct. It was anonymous. And then I did have a question about home and hospital and you, you alluded to that as well. So the this program and home and hospital are still distinct separate programs, correct? Definitely. Yes. OK, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great question. Yep, any other questions? Mr. Handy. Yes, Mr. Handy. Hi, I just have one question. Um, could uh, you all restate the overall enrollment for the VLP again? I know you said it was about 2,000 students roughly, I believe, at the top of the presentation. Yes, that is for me slide three. Um, approximately 3,000 students from throughout VCPS who are enrolled in the virtual learning program. OK. That was for January 2022. It is it is less. There are fewer students than 3000 at this point, um, okay. but that's the number that we pulled from January 22 that we shared yeah. again in January with you as well. OK, gotcha. All right, thank you. Um, I'm sorry when you said that there's less students now when it was 3000 and now there's less. Is that because they've returned to in person? They left the VLP or moved program or something. Back. Correct. Right. Or moved. Mm -hmm. OK. Yep. Right. All right, thank you all very much. Thank you. Uh, it looks, looks like our next um, item is program information updates, and for that we call on Mr. Doug Handy, Douglas Handy. Yes, um, thank you, Ms. Scott. Uh, so for this item, I wanted to check in with the committee members around our topics for our remaining meetings. So for April, uh, staff is working on a presentation on suspension rate uh, data, so we'll be bringing that forward in April. And then we have our May and June meetings. Uh, so uh, typically, we I think we've been having about one topic per month. I think we do have space for two, if that's the desire of the committee. And just wanted to review, so I'm gonna check my notes. We have um, some topics that you all shared. I think this is in November. So I just wanted to circle back, look at these topics and get your input on which topics you wanted to see in our remaining meetings. Um, so just about uh, about five or six that I'll review. So one was um, employment and retention of uh, staff of color. Uh, there was another request around uh, disparities for advanced courses, uh, AP and GT uh, throughout the system, uh, why some schools offer so many, while others offer so few. Uh, another topic was our multilingual learners. Uh, students in our ESOL program and their access to extracurricular activities, advanced courses, and college and career readiness. And there was a last one was student access to extracurricular activities. Uh, so wanted to get a sense from you all on which ones you'd like to see. I will say that last one, I, I'm trying to get my head around how we would pull that data. That would be 
challenging in that it would really cause us to work with almost every school. Because um, if you look at your, you know, athletic programs, um, you know, that's something we could centralize, but then we get into like all the different school clubs and activities that would really take us to work at the school level. So uh, that would be um, considerable effort to stand that one up as a presentation. Just want to comment on that, but uh, wanted to, you know, get input from you all on what you all wanted to see for the remaining of our meetings. Okay, thank you for that. So I'll go around and ask everyone. Um, I can just start. Um, at, uh, again, the suspension rate data that will be coming in April, so that is good. Yep. Um, and I actually wanted to see, um, all of these <laughs> really okay. at our, <laughs> at our um, uh, upcoming meetings. I mean, I think these are all very, very important. Um, also, I wanted to know as far as, um because I know we did one at the very beginning of when the equity committee was established an equity audit. And mm -hmm. I wanted to know about the feasibility of having a presentation on another one being done okay. again. Gotcha. Because the last one was done, I think in uh, 2020. Yes, correct. And yeah, it was pre COVID. Correct, right. So um, I would see maybe having that added as something um, that would be done again and then could be added to an upcoming meeting for presentation. OK. OK, and so I'll just go around again. Um, I will start with Mr. Thomas. Thank you, uh, Mr. Handy. At the last uh, at the February meeting, I had requested possibly having an agenda item or discussion on the possibility of gender neutral bathrooms in some of our older constructed buildings, you know, besides the 15 to 20 that currently have the bathrooms available. And I was wondering if that was still a feasible um, possibility. Yes, yes. So, Mr. Thomas, I know uh, staff, we were actually in the process of looking into that. We actually have like a subcommittee for our LGBTQ work group, uh, subcommittee on facilities. So, we're uh, planning a meeting. So, I gather today I do not have feedback for you, um, but it's certainly, um, I'm looking even as early as April. Um, I definitely will have an update for you, but just to let you know, as a result of your, your request, uh, we have started to move forward on trying to get some some uh, solutions or, you know, essentially, like you said, like what happens to existing buildings. So I, I could have an update for you um, in April. Um, it might not be a full presentation, uh, but I certainly could get an update um, as a follow up to to what you stated. Uh, but let me see if I had something more detailed, we could bring it back to the full presentation, uh, but I will certainly have an update for you. OK, thank you. Um, and I guess for the last one, you said it'll be really hard to kind of look at the extracurricular activities kind of going on a school by school basis, but it, we could also just kind of look at like uh, there there's the uh, the EDAs that are available in each of our schools, and I think that data might be a little easier to find um, and kind of looking at where those offerings are there. So I do w want to focus on extracurriculars in some way. It doesn't even have to be uh, athletics per se, um, but mm -hmm. some of the other opportunities that are available because I I think you know, from my educational experience, those have been very beneficial and, and very important to me. And when I'm visiting schools across the county, some schools are like incredible with the amount of activities and clubs that they have. Other schools, you know, are still working on those. So I want to see how how this board maybe can support those efforts to expand them. OK, so extracurriculars and like any disparities. Um, well, like like I stated, right? So I think the original request was who was most likely to participate uh, what are some barriers to prevent students from participating? Um, are schools offering enough? Yeah, and it can, we could focus on like the high school level or the middle school level. You know, we could focus on one level instead of doing like school wide and maybe take it step by step, I guess. Gotcha. OK. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. Uh, next is Dr. Hager. Um, yes, I. I'm very interested in the recruitment and retention topic, but I imagine that might be better discussed in the summer after the school year is over. I, is, I don't know if that's an accurate assumption. The teacher recruitment and retention. Yep, and Dr. Hager is making note. Um, so I know for the system, spring actually the heavy hiring season. So we might be able to get an early read if we come back, you know, with like a June update. Um, because, you know, we don't want to, when we go into the summer, we like to have positions filled. And of course, it's not always that way. Uh, but let me check in with uh, my colleagues and see if we can bring something on that. Um, and yeah. like you said, considering the timing that you mentioned. Yeah, I mean, and if, it, if it's not, a, if it's too soon, then then, then I understand. Um, and <laughs> then there's a new topic that we, I 
Ms. Scott and I talked about a few times, and I don't know if it, we ever actually brought it up during the meeting, would be um, a new approach to public comment during board meetings that would hmm. provide an opportunity for folks who can't get themselves to Towson and, and wait for, you know, many hours to uh, to be heard. Um, and I, uh, we've chatted, you know, offline about whether, what other school systems do, what other states, you know, other um, districts around the country do to, um, to provide a variety of opportunities for public comment um, during board meetings. We sure did. Good point. Thank you for remembering that. Okay. Hmm, that's an interesting one. Okay, I will. I will look into that. Just curious, have you all, have you gathered any information to this point? I guess what I'm thinking, I'm certainly will, can explore. Just want to know if there's a starting point. You know, some information that you've all already gathered. I could, you know, pick up from there. Um, it came up at the maid meeting um, a little bit, and and I I started asking a few people because it came up. You know, how others folks do it, and they and it sounded like from the folks that I spoke to. Everyone was very interested in finding a new way, <laughs> but I don't know that many people have figured it out quite yet. And I, I, you know, it could be one of those COVID opportunities where people are more used to logging on to different, um, you know, internet, you know, Zoom or whatever it is to, mm -hmm. to, to do this, you know, we, we could take advantage of that. Just thinking that, you know, we, we are likely excluding a lot of voices by the way that we do things, so. Gotcha, okay, yep, I will, I will explore that. Yes, Paul and um, Dr. Hager, if we, if I, um, now that you said, because I, um, if we have anything, we could email that over to Mr. Handy. Um, any suggestions or any, anything like that? Um, that would be great. Okay, Miss Jos. Miss Jos. Nothing, Miss Scott. Oh, nothing. Okay, thank you. Um, and one more thing, Mr. Handy, um, I know we uh, had worked on this and everything, but maybe an update as far as the um, anti-racism posters. Yes. Um, yeah, an update on that would be great, like, because um, I, I don't know if they've already gone up or if they're in the process of going up. But I know we, as a committee, spent a considerable amount of time on that and um, yeah, absolutely. They're I would tell you there, we, we've got a, mm -hmm. yes, yes, ma'am. We have um, a bit of a redesign that they're going through. So I want to offer that as an option, uh, but I will. A redesign? Uh, well, a couple, couple concerns. The, so the, the poster as stated is, is, it's missing to me a very important student identifier. And we talked about this in a few meetings. It doesn't mention religion. And we know that we have students um, and I'm thinking about some of our students who are of the Muslim faith and may wear head coverings and they seem to be targeted um, in that regard. And I just don't want to put out something that's incomplete in terms of uh, our stance on, um, you know, who we are, who we're trying to support and uh, our stance on non-discrimination against, if you will. So part of it is how our policy is written. And that's really what I've been doing um, since we brought the poster forward. So I want to make sure it's phrased in a way that we're not, um, that is as inclusive as possible um, about our commitment to equity. And as it stands now, there's nothing about religion in the front matter, if you will, this, this top portion of our policy, and that's what was put into the poster. However, if you look at the social identifier section and the definition section of the policy, um, that is in there um, as a comment. So part of it was some rephrasing that I wanted to offer up. Um, but again, the, the the original one is there, you know, as a comparison, but there is a, a redesign that I would like to offer for consideration. Okay, can that come to at the next meeting then? So the committee, I would like, we would like to have some input definitely on that and see that. Oh, review. absolutely. Oh, yes, yes, I was right. Certainly would, would not move forward without, without that. Yes. Yeah, yeah, if we could have that um, at the April meeting, then that would be great. All right. Yeah, because I know that was something that was important. It was vetted and um, a lot of people um, gave considerable input. So um, I wasn't aware that it was missing uh, religion. Um, uh, so yeah, OK. Yeah. All right, anyone else? Any other comments? No? 
OK, anything else, Mr. Andy? Uh, no, Ms. Scott, that's all for me. Thank you. Great. All right. So the last item on the agenda is announcements. Uh, the next equity committee meeting will um, with the Equity Advisory Council will be held on Thursday, March 24, 2022 at 5.30 p.m. So thank you, everyone. And the next Equity Committee meeting will be held on Thursday, April 21st, 2022 at 4 p.m. So um, if there is no further business, then um, hearing none, the meeting is now adjourned. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, everyone. Everybody has a good evening. Bye-bye. Take care.